I'm going to speak about the desire of all nations this morning. The text is found in the book of Haggai, <clears throat> chapter 2, and I will read verses 6 and 7. For now, I'll read some more surrounding verses a little later on. Haggai 2, verses 6 and 7. This is from the King James Version. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> well, that sure sounds good. Unfortunately, I have to deal with a, a little problem here at the outset, <clears throat> having to do with a lot of the different translations of the Bible. There's a reason why I noted that this is from the King James Version that I'm reading. I want to establish that this is indeed talking about Jesus Christ. And as odd as it may seem, if you have a certain Bible translation, you won't get that out of it. So I want to deal with that. This is talking about Jesus. <clears throat> there are some of the versions that have translated the text that the desired things of all nations shall come or even the desired treasures of the nations will be brought here. So I want to deal with this. I want to answer these two questions. Was the Holy Spirit saying that the nations were going to bring their desired things, their treasures, to the temple in Jerusalem? Or is he saying that the desire of nations, which is Jesus Christ, is going to come to the temple? Is he talking about Jesus? or treasures. And another question, is the Holy Spirit speaking of the temple in Jerusalem, or is he speaking of another temple, a temple of a different nature? Is this prophecy concerning the temple in Jerusalem being filled with silver and gold from all the nations, or is it a prophecy of the time when Jesus Christ comes to his temple? <clears throat> now you'll be able to answer these questions on your own just by uh, the mere fact that we're at the Refreshing Waters Renewal, the theme of which is the prophecies of Jesus Christ, and I'm speaking on the desire of nations, so it's not real hard to figure out what I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> but I still want to deal with this because we'll get some edification out of this also. <clears throat> now, I have no doubt that the people who heard Haggai prophesy understood him to mean that the treasures of the nations would be brought to this temple that they were working on. That's probably the way they understood that. But we don't necessarily need to take that into consideration when dealing with the scriptures because God has a way of speaking through the prophets that mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people in different times. <clears throat> and they're all true. The Jews looked in great anticipation for their Messiah and they formed their ideas of the Messiah on the scriptures, on the prophets, what they had said. And when the Messiah came, they hated him and they crucified him. So what I'm saying is here is when we take a text and we consider it, we don't necessarily have to consider how the people at that time looked at it. It's not, not always valid. Sometimes it may be, but not always. <clears throat> For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So that's what we need, is the spirit of God in understanding the scriptures. Now if you were a context person, you might say that we can tell what is meant in this text by examining the context around it. <clears throat> now for just some background information, we can go to the book of Ezra, <clears throat> the first four chapters. And just as a matter of history, you know that the, the Israelites were taken captive by the Babylonians. And when their time was up, the Medes and the Persians came in. <clears throat> now, uh, during this time, the Daniel ministered. Daniel wrote and prophesied. <clears throat> this is when, uh, during the Babylonian period, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar were kings. And Daniel also continued his ministry into the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. 
And when Cyrus was king of Persia, the Lord put it in Cyrus' heart to tell the Jews to, to go back to Judah. Go back to Judah, and those of you that were in Jerusalem, go back to Jerusalem, and let's rebuild the temple. This is the king of, of Persia that, that ordered this. The Lord put it in his heart to do this. So this is the period that we're talking about here. Ezra wrote during this time, Haggai, Zechariah. <clears throat> in Ezra chapter 3, it spoke... He speaks about when they rebuilt the altar. That's the first thing they did. They rebuilt the altar in the temple. As it is written, and they begin to sacrifice on the altar, as it is written in the law of Moses. Now a few months later, approximately a year and a half later, they laid the foundation of the temple and began to build upon it. But their adversaries troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Now, if you know the scriptures, you know that during this time, when they finished the foundation of the temple, there was a great noise that the people made. There were some elderly people there that remembered Solomon's temple in its former glory. And there were other people there that were very joyous because they were beginning a new work. And the scriptures say that you couldn't tell the sound of the weeping from the sound of the shouting. And it said the noise was heard afar off. So now their adversaries hear this. Remember, they uh, in a sense, in captivity by the Medes and Persians. This is the Medo-Persian kingdom they're living in. So there's Medes and Persians around. They don't like this. The Jews are getting back together and rebuilding the city. They're rebuilding the temple. Wait a minute. They don't like this. So these adversaries hire counselors, and they write letters to the king. There's been a change in kings. Cyrus isn't king anymore. A different king comes up. And he takes heed to these letters, and he tells the people, he sends out a message to tell the Jews, stop building this temple. We don't want any trouble. You stop this building. Ezra chapter 4, verse 24 says, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Well, it stopped. The king said stop, and they stopped. I don't know exactly for how long it stopped, but it was at least two years because there's a change in king. The, my text in the book of Haggai, Haggai wrote during the second year of Darius' reign. So bare minimum, the work had stopped for two years at least. <clears throat> Even though the Lord put it in Cyrus' heart to allow them to move back to Jerusalem, and they were allowed to move back to Judah, they were allowed to rebuild the, the temple and they had already made progress. This, this is all the Lord's doing. See, you, I'm trying to give you the context here, what's going on. That this is the Lord's doing. This is a wonderful thing that they were able to do this. And then the king says, stop, and they just stop. Now, God take this seriously because they didn't see what kind of situation they were in. This is, this is the situation that Haggai is addressing that they, the Lord created this situation where they could make progress, and they received a letter from the king, and they just stopped. Okay, that's it. I guess, guess we're not going to build a temple now. It's a serious matter. You make the application to your own selves also and to our society and the churches today. If the Lord makes way for us to do something, let's not stop and receive a little bit of difficulty along the way because the Lord takes this seriously. Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. Now the Lord's going to speak to the people and stir them up. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye did run every man into his own house. 
Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and even upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Now I'm happy to report that when the people heard this message, they took heed to it. <clears throat> Haggai chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 says that they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And Ezra records in his book, chapter 5 verses 1 and 2, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. Amen. So remember, the foundation's already been laid. The altar was built some years ago. So they've got a little finished, <clears throat> and the project is underway again. Now, my text, Haggai chapter 2, this is spoken after they've already started the work. So here's another note you might want to make. The word of the Lord will come to you as you're doing his work. When you're sitting idly by, you receive chastening, not good words, not encouraging words from the Lord. So as they, as they have started rebuilding again, this wonderful promise from our text comes to them. I'm going to start again in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? That is when Solomon's temple in its original state. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes, in comparison of it, as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. Remember, they're in the midst of adversaries. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once... One more time, in just a little while, I will, shake all, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, greater than when the Lord filled it with his glory when Solomon finished the temple, greater than that, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, that's the context. <clears throat> now, it seems most logical or as some would say, the natural rendering of the text indicates that God is going to shake the heavens and the earth, the desire of nations would come, and that the temple they were rebuilding, this place, would be filled with glory. And we might, if we're just talking about human reason and logic, we might further reason that since he mentioned silver and gold, that's what the desire of nations was, that the temple would be filled with silver and gold. And that's probably why some of the translators chose to translate it that way. <clears throat> Let me also add that no less than nine of the major Bible versions support that view. <clears throat> some translate the phrase desire of, all desire of all nations and others desirable things of all nations. The treasure of all nations, says the English Standard Version and the Revised Standard. The contemporary English version says their treasures. Basic Bible in English says the desired things of all nations. The American Standard Version says the precious things of all nations. New American Standard, the wealth of all nations. 
New Century Version says, they will bring their wealth. Now, what is so disturbing to me about these different versions, first, that's not a literal translation. The literal text does not say things, does not say their treasures. What's so disturbing about this is that they have translated the text in such a way that it is impossible for a person who reads it to get the idea that the Holy Spirit might have been talking about Jesus and not treasures. That's disturbing. That's not translating a text, that's interpreting a text. I don't know why anyone wants to render a text naturally when the natural man receiveth not the things of God. I'm being slightly sarcastic, you know that. I know that's not what people mean when they say that. <clears throat> the desire of nations is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, how do we know this? Well, first, let's start with a simple observation. Let's assume that the phrase desire of nations does indeed mean the treasures of all nations. Let's assume that the temple in Jerusalem was or is going to be restored and that it will be filled with silver, gold, and other treasures from all over the world. Now my reaction to that news is, so what? What does that have to do with anything? How glorious is that for you and me? Not very. <clears throat> God's a lot bigger than that. The scriptures say, The desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Should we then conclude that the glory of God is associated with silver and gold and other treasures of the nations? Now, there was a lot of silver and gold and brass in the temple. Make no doubt about it. You can read about that. But that's not why God was there. That wasn't the glory of it. God was the glory of it. Should we conclude that the obtaining of these treasures from all nations requires the shaking of heaven and earth? I don't think so. Now, this might appeal to the earthly mind, but spiritually, it just doesn't add up. Consider also the nature of the kingdom of God. It is ever-increasing, ever-growing. It is always upward and onward, never downward or backward. It never stops. It never slows down. It never retreats. It has been advancing ever since the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. Now, does the advancement of the kingdom of God mean more of the same stuff? More silver, more gold, more brass, more sacrifices, more priests, more laws? Is that, is that the nature of this? No, not at all. <clears throat> Even though this might have been how the people in Haggai's day looked at it. Now, there are three main things in this text that are promised. There's the shaking of all things. The prophet Joel spoke of this shaking. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. This is when the desire of all nations shall come. I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about the desire. <clears throat> what I saw here was that, that God has made Jesus desirable to us. He has caused us to behold his beauty. Now, it's not that Jesus was not desirable, but we didn't see it. We didn't see anything of God. <clears throat> My heart is indicting a good matter. I will speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a, is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. God has made him to be the desire of nations. It is the Father's will that Jesus came to perform. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. 
This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Jesus knew these promises were made for him, and he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. It was the Father that bruised him. It was the Father that put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Not only was God working through Jesus Christ, but God also works in us. God makes us desire him also. He has gathered people from all nations. He has drawn us with the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ and made us to desire him. Whether Jew or Gentile, those who belong to Jesus Christ are no longer forsaken, no longer desolate, no longer barren, no longer refused as a bride. He has drawn us with his loving kindness and tender mercies. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. For he satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. He turneth the wilderness into standing water, and dry ground into water springs. He maketh the hungry to dwell there, and there that he may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. These are things that attracted us to Jesus Christ and to God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. These are expressions of people of, of David and of psalmist, those that have seen God. As a heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait. In his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The Lord has prepared a sumptuous feast of fat things for us. He has imputed unto us his own righteousness along with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What shall we render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward us? <clears throat> from every generation, from Adam until now, from every nation on this earth, there have been people that have been drawn by the goodness, the beauty, and the righteousness of God. They have seen of his wealth and of the greatness of his kingdom. They have seen his great love and that he has even given himself as the sacrifice for our sins. They have seen his holiness, his ability and willingness to bless abundantly, his abundant grace and tender mercies. They have experienced that transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and have seen that he is all we need. Who is made, God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Jesus Christ was indeed lifted up and drew all men, and those that looked were quickened together with him. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The response to God was heard from all nations, yes, I will marry you. Now the Lord has also prepared us as a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. Not only has God made Jesus beautiful and desirable to us, but he is making us beautiful, a bride for his son. Now we are waiting for the desire of all nations to come and to get his bride. While we wait, we are being changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. For they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. They that are Christ also long for that midnight cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. 
We are clothed of God. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Then the heavens will shake, the earth, the sea, and the dry land, and all nations will be shaken, and the desire of nations shall come. Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 9, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the last seven plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, just like Haggai promised. And her light was like a stone, most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision, I will satisfy her poor with bread, I will also clothe her priests, with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Now, there is a remnant among all nations. He is the desire of all nations. This, of course, does not mean that every single person in every nation, but the remnant. There are representatives, if you will, from all nations that belong to the Lord. He is the Lord of hosts. His bride has made herself ready, and she anxiously and patiently awaits his return. Here in this earth, his loved ones are oppressed, troubled, persecuted, and hated. They seek deliverance from their enemies and that eternal rest that is promised to those who believe and fight the good fight of faith. We desire him because he gave himself for us, took away our sins, made us kings and priests, clothed us with righteousness. He first loved us, made us accepted by God in him, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light promised to come and deliver us, and saved us, washed us in his own blood, purged our consciences, has begotten us, and loves us. Those belong to, that belong to him do not love the world, but have hearts for him only. They have sanctified themselves for him. They have remained pure and unspotted from the world for him. He has made provisions for us to do all of this. Those who do not desire his coming do not desire him. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. I have several texts here that talk about the nations. This is a wonderful thing to consider also, that how that God is working this. <clears throat> Blindness in part has happened to the Jews for the present time, but God is working so that all nations will belong to him by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over the people, and the veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. 
and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, the day the desire of nations comes, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. I like the, the pictures here that we get of these glorious things in heaven. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The Lord is building his house, both of Jews and Gentiles. <clears throat> is he God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen the stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. Thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou hast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee. For a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. We are building his house, in a sense, as the people in Haggai's day were. <clears throat> Every man should be careful how he buildeth on the foundation. We're not building a physical temple, but a temple which is the body of Christ, his bride. We are building in the midst of our enemies, surrounded by things that trouble us and cause us to fear. We are in captivity, being in bondage to our mortal bodies and the law of sin that remains in it. And yet his spirit remains with us just as it did on the day that you came out of Egypt. His word to us is, be strong and work, for I am with you. Amen. Now let us not be fooled into thinking that building his temple means exclusively the winning of souls. <clears throat> we are connected to the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Amen. We are Christ's bride, and we are like the bride on her wedding day. And on the wedding day, the bride rises up early, and the, the only task she sets herself to is to prepare to meet the bridegroom. From head to heel, fingernail to toenail, hair, eyes, lips, lashes, brows, hands, knees, elbows, and every other inch of skin, is made beautiful and pleasant so that she may present herself to her groom, clothed with the beautiful white wedding garments of purity and righteousness. Now this is made difficult for us because of the environment that we are working in. Building the temple is not an easy task, but the grace of God is effective and abundant. <clears throat> in closing, I want to read from the book of the Revelation, a view of this temple, view of the city of God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, 
for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Come, desire of nations, come. Amen. 